Welcome to Manavani, the voice of humanism. I am Babu Gogineni, and with me is the celebrity chef Aditya Gunti to continue our fascinating discussion on food and culture. Mm. We are not talking about recipes and how to make certain dishes. We are going deeper and further away in history and into the future to look at the role that food plays in our lives, in our health, in our thinking, <clears throat> and in our relation with our fellow beings. We were in the last episode talking about various kinds of food around the world. And a burning question unresolved yet is why did, you know the joke about why did the chicken cross the road? But more importantly, my question is, why did the chicken get 65 in its name? Aditya? Hello, sir. How are you? Very good, my friend. Uh, so, chicken 65 was a question that we put in last episode. I'm sure many of people are eagerly waiting to know what's the facts behind it. Uh, when I was understanding the chicken 65 preparation and its origin way back in India, uh, I came through a few stories that what people believe in. Some people believe that the age of chicken is of 65 days. And some line cooks believe that there are 65 ingredients in the recipe. And in Chennai, in Tamil Nadu, where the dish originated, they believe that this is from a restaurant and it was introduced and started in the year 1965. But none of this had really made sense for me. With little more further inquiries and checking with people, talking to people, I understand that this has started in Chennai. But when North Indian people have come to Chennai, that there is a communication barrier because of the language. The North Indians don't speak Tamil and Tamilians can't speak Hindi. So in the restaurants where you go, generally normal any restaurants you go, there are names of the dishes and there are photographs next to it. So in this particular restaurant, wherever these people went to have their food, there are dishes like, let's say, breakfast, idli, vada, dosa, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and then uh, lamb dishes, 20, 30, 21, 22, 23, 24, and then fish, 25, whatever, 30, 40. So this is really item number 65. Absolutely right. So the person who don't know how to, because the menus are written in Tamil, the only reference for, for the person to order is by through photographs. So he liked the chicken, and the photograph 65. So he said, I need this chicken and then photograph 65. That's how the chicken 65 have started actually. When these people go, went back to their places, they started, okay, I had chicken 65 in Chennai. And today, it, 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 many of uh, South Indians, Telugu people and Tamil Nadu people, chicken 65 is a very good starter for any kind of meal of the day. Whatever its item number is now. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then, <laughs> With this, with this understanding, people started in restaurants to have mutton 95, total, as you said, 345, whatever number it comes to you. It, it is just not knowing the facts behind it and come, coming up with a fancy number. I've even seen chicken triple nine, triple fives. It, it's all fascinations. Well, this is so interesting. Thank you for being on this show, Aditya. You bring so much information and knowledge and perspective to the various questions we have in mind. Some of them are frivolous questions. Some of them are serious ones. But in the last episode, when you were taking me and the listeners on this journey of the different kinds of strange and funny foods that are consumed around the world, we did not cover the entire globe, did we? Not really. So. Things like cheese and extraordinary things. One of the first things about cheese was I didn't know how to translate it into my mother tongue, Telugu, when I was a kid. And then I started learning French uh, as a kid. And I was introduced to the idea of cheese as something special. And I took a long time to understand one can eat cheese, which is covered with fungus, till I discovered that actually our curd is that, it's full of bacteria. 
many of the things that we eat, like you pointed out previously, mushrooms are basically fungi and so on and so forth. But with cheese, I think people really cross the limits, don't they? Rotten cheese. Uh, yes, you rightly said that. Uh, we also already that when milk is rotten, you get cheese, and then you rot the cheese. <laughs> Can you tell us more? Yeah, we, we spoke about gorgonzola, where where we infuse penicillinium bacteria in it, and the yogurts that we use also have lactobacillus. These are the good bacteria that we can have for our guts. There is a special cheese called as kazu marzu cheese. It is from Sardinia region of Italy. It is very similar to the hard cheese pecorino. You would, as a French person, you should have known about the camembert and uh, the gorgonzola from Italy, as I spoke about Stilton from England. Pecorino is also a hard cheese from Italy. So mm -hmm. this special cheese, kazu marzu, are left half opened and for the cheese flies, the maggots to live in there, infest in there, grow in there, eat the cheese and leave their feces in there. So the acids of the larvae break down the cheese fats and makes it much more softer. The hard cheese turns into a little more softer cheese and the flavor of the cheese gets from it, the maggot feces. And the cheese, believers, the cheese eaters believe that whoever likes this cheese, they say that this cheese is not good if the worms are dead. It is really shocking for me to come through this cheese, but this is also a culture which we need to accept. Hang on, you are talking about rotten milk, which is cheese, which is now infested with flies, and then there are eggs, and the eggs hatch, and then you have the maggots, and the maggots are living in it, and they are excreting in it, and people love it. And they eat when the maggots are alive, crawling the cheese. So it is. So they eat the maggots also. Yes. So you have a glass of wine and, and a piece of this cheese, uh, the live worms crawling around in your mouth, and then you, you take it inside. And no sacred religion ever banned that. <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> then Gosh, I have to, this is something. I have to also speak about a few other. Uh, uncommon. Equally disgusting things? Or? <laughs> it might be disgusting for a few sections of people, but definitely it's, 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 it's into someone's culture and they love it. It's a delicacy of their own cuisines. Of so, course, of course we are joking about this. Absolutely. Actually, you know, in India there is a law. If you make fun of someone about their dress or their food habits, then it is a criminal offence. Mm. Especially the vegetarians who make fun of the non-vegetarian food and how bad it is and how ugly the whole habit is and things like that. And if it is said, not in humor, but with a me with an intention to provoke, attack somebody's lifestyle, then it is a criminal offense. For example, you cannot attack someone for being a beef eater. Of course, in today's India, people are being physically attacked for being beef eaters. But that's the law, though. This yes, definitely comes under discrimination. Uh, let me t t take you through a couple of more things that might be interesting, but still <laughs> uncommon food. Have you ever heard of Chinese century egg? These are preserved eggs with charcoal, sand, and, and then they are kept for, kept for a long time. They're also called as 100 years eggs. Uh, the, because of the preservation, the eggs turns into a dark black color and then it becomes a little more harder. These are the boiled eggs. And, and then they've got very pungent uh, aromas to it. Uh, in Malaysia and China, they have this along with their uh, early morning breakfast which is called as um, porridge in their language uh, with konzi. So they have this egg, egg is an accompaniment to the, as a con, uh, accompaniment to the konzi for Chinese people. Uh, we also used to talk a lot about uh, egg in TV and also on the big question about the ostrich egg. Uh, and I'm telling you about the chicken eggs. We also spoke about caveats of fish eggs. We spoke about duck, the Chinese Peking duck and uh, uh, duck reared, the, the confit made up of uh, duck, 
which which are cooked slow cooked in the fats of uh, fats of the bird or or dairy fat. Now I want to talk about balut. It is a. Um, I just want to before we move to the next um, interesting dish you want to talk about. I want to pay tribute to those visionary Chinese. Who a hundred years ago thought of their great grandchildren and what they would eat for breakfast, and took the eggs and preserved them for posterity. This must be some visionary thing. Mm -hmm. They built the walls and they saved and stored the eggs. Oh, interesting to know that as well, sir. Um, so the balut is is an uh, developing bird embryo of a duck. So we we spoke about last in last episode we spoke that egg does not have life yet, but these are the developing eggs which there is already life in there and the the bird is still forming in there. Uh, so these are just uh, briefly and they cook it and eat it or yes they just briefly boil or steam it and then they eat this uh, still developing. Bird embryo. This is of Chinese origin, and it is considered as a national dish of Philippines, along with adobo, uh, consumed in Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, Laos. The fertilized bird egg, which is not fully incubated, is briefly boiled, and it is eaten from its shell itself. The shell is just broken, and then it is just taken as a delicacy. There are many controversies to it uh, whether it can be ethically acceptable or not. Several groups in U.S. have moved a petition to take out this balut in the menus from restaurants, and the Philippines in New York has made a counter petition to leave the food and don't don't make any issues out of it. In a, in, in Islam, these are ha haram because the animal is still not slaughtered, and it is partially grown embryo. In Judaism, uh, it is forbidden because it's fertilized bird uh, embryo in egg. In Christianity also it's forbidden because it is strangled, meaning these animals who die without bleeding blood on the earth, they can't have this. And it refrains to eat, and, and the religion refrains to eat blood as well, because the blood needs to be poured on the earth as water. This discussion of religion and blood, uh, we will speak in episode six for sure. Uh, so this is one of one of the uncommon food. That so what strikes me. What strikes me is religion claims to give morality, but here it's not even referring to pain or the fact that the life is not yet in full form. They're simply saying you did not cut it the right way, you did not kill it the right way, you the blood did not fall on the earth or should not fall on the earth, and therefore do not eat. Yes, all immature thoughts. So, Completely irrelevant to what should be discussed. I'm with you in that. Uh, now mm -hmm. let's moving forward. Have you ever heard of milt? It might be more disgust to you uh, because these are the male genital of a fish where they contain sperm, and this is used as a food. In many cultures, they eat um, milt of cod, sea bean, salmon. These are the varieties of fish. And in Korea, mm. Japan, Romania, Russia, they also they fry it and and they eat as a food. In Indonesia, they make a curry with this, and this is this is not a dish by itself, but is generally accompanied to some other dish. Would you dare to try this? I don't think so. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I think uh, while I respect the fact that others eat what I don't think I would. My limitations start with coriander. Don't forget, <laughs> forget fish and their genitalia and developing bird embryos and hundred-year-old um, eggs. I'm okay with looking at them as curiosities, but I'm fairly limited uh, in how much I can push the line. I must say, I was offered gorilla meat in Nigeria. Uh, mm. But I said I don't eat my cousins. Mm -hmm. I don't want it. Um, snake. I somehow I know that it's not very different to other animals I've eaten, but somehow snake I did not want to eat. 
but crocodile was okay for me. So each one has his own limitations. It's the idea of disgust and it's not religion which um, guides me, not even question the morality because that's not the point here. But whether as a person you feel attracted to the idea or not. For example, I would never eat or try the eyeballs of animals that anyway we eat. It just doesn't appeal to me. Yeah, uh, in Hyderabadi cuisine also we have uh, this uncommon food like Gurda Kapura, the testicles and kidney of an animal. Uh, and then we also have Paya, the trotters of an animal. And the breakfast of in, in uh, Hyderabad also, the Zaban ki Nihari, it, it's a tongue of the animal that is made into a Nihari curry. And there are Boti curries which are also served in marriages. Uh, these are the intestines of an animal. Those are cut and cooked with spices and made into a dry dish. Uh, when so I in Hyderabad, the testicles of animals are cooked and sold. Yes, and th these are very famous. It's, it's part of the Hyderabadi cuisine. I wonder how many of our listeners are familiar with this. <laughs> It's just nice things to discuss and understand the culture of Hyderabad as well in, in this episode. Uh, mm -hmm. It reminds me, it, brought, it brings back me all the memories that I had in Hyderabad to try all these different dishes at late nights to early mornings. Uh, when I've traveled to Thailand, my friend took me around the local markets of Thailand. So as a food enthusiast, I travel to different countries to understand the culture. I go into you know, people's lives and cultures to understand how the food has been transformed in ages and how have uh, they been influenced by food and how they influence the food. So while, while I was walking through the local markets, uh, I had to made a, make a stop because I was surprised to see there are barbecue scorpions, there are bucks like crickets which are fried and had as a snack along with alcohol uh, and the duck beaks which are being grilled on, on a grill, on a hot grill and uh, in Vietnam, I also heard that uh, they eat rats, snakes, mongoose, you rightly said gorillas in some countries. And uh, in Thailand, Malaysia and um, Cambodia, Vietnam, China, they also have uh, snake wines where the snakes are kept in the wines and they, and they say that this wine helps you for body pains. They also have cobra whiskey where the cobras are left in the whiskey <laughs> bottles and aged along with the whiskies. If you go to Vietnam, there are, there are particular villages where they have the snake heart, which is still pulsating, a live snake being cut and quickly the heart is taken out and put it into the uh, shot of cheap liquor. While that snake heart is pulsating, you are expected to have the shot from your mouth into the stomach. But these are, and, and also um, let's speak about um, uh, in, when I went to Thailand, my, old, my friend also said that, okay, the next day morning, I'll take you to a jumping chicken market. I'm a chicken lover so because I'm coming from Hyderabad. I have you known from chicken 65 to chicken biryanis. So I said, okay, this might be new days. Let's go and try. And she took the market and I was shocked to see that jumping chickens are nothing but frogs. <laughs> uh, this big frog market where the live frogs are being de-skinned and sold. They have this fried jumping chicken, the frog legs, as a snack as well. Uh, it's interesting to see all these um, people, cultures and lives that is been so much involved with the cultures and availability of the local um, regions. In Chhattisgarh also, there are tribes who eat red ants with their eggs which are made into a chutney that is being pounded in a mortar and pestle along with garlic, salt, lemon juice and chilies. In Northeast India, there are... And not cooked. They're not cooked, they're chutneys. The chutneys are not cooked. Well, you know, this... Um, I know that in Uganda, when I went, uh, though I it was never offered to me, but I know that in Uganda, they eat almost like what you said, but sometimes cook, uh, fried. Uh, white ants, mm -hmm. uh, they are eaten. But you know what? 
it's making me think when we started tracing the history of food, we spoke about how fire came and cooking started and a different stage in human consumption of food was attained. But again, some of the weird things you're mentioning are the pre-cooking days. You take a snake, cut it open, don't kill it. The heart is still pumping. You take it and put it in your liquor to get a kick out of it. There's no cooking there. Yes. You make a chutney out of ants. It's not cooked. Wow. So this, these things are still being continued in, in few uh, regions and few cultures. So we have to appreciate that uh, these are being given to them from past many years as a culture. In mm -hmm. Northeast India, they eat dogs, the pet dogs, the dogs, the, stray, the, the dogs as well. Uh, they have a dog festival in a particular month that where they celebrate the barbecue dogs and different dishes that's made from dog meat. In Kohima, mm -hmm. Northeast, they also eat wasps. Uh, but talking of dogs, I'm just reminded of a distant memory that comes to me. Um, in Korea, they eat dogs, don't they? Yes. Uh, so I made a friend. Uh, it's a very funny story. Uh, you know, have you heard of Reverend Moon, M-O-O-N? No, sir. Reverend Moon was uh, a crazy Christian evangelical preacher from Korea, and he has millions of followers. So my friend was uh, also from there. I met him in France. And this fellow was trying to convert me into Christianity. So the whole thing was rather comic. And he was telling me about Jesus and things like that. I probably know the Bible as well as any other Christian does. So I asked him some questions to which he had no answers. And then I said, oh, leave all that. You guys in Korea, you eat dogs, don't you? I meant it to put him down. And his reaction, oh, we don't eat any dog. There are special dogs that we eat. <laughs> uh, for an Indian from South India, of course, eating a dog was rather taboo in my mind, cultural taboo. Yeah. But please go on, you, I'm stopping you from telling us about more strange foods for Indians. So there's wasps in Kohima where they make fry and curries out of it. And in north, northeastern tribes, there are also rotten potatoes eaten there. So there is also an uncommon fruit, which is durian, called as king of fruits by people who uh. enjoy food. <laughs> I, can, I can imagine your expression now. Uh, it is banned uh, in, in Singapore to eat durian in the tube, in the underground yes, metro yes. lines. And you can't take them into many of the shopping malls or public places because it's got a peculiar flavor to it. It's very hard to again No, no, no. Don't, don't say <laughs> flavor. Nobody can call that flavor. I'm, I'm beginning to throw up as you talk to me about it. <laughs> Okay, let's say order. <laughs> Flavor <laughs> is a friendly word for a nasty smell. Um, actually, um, I went to Singapore um, and then, you know, as an adventure, reckless adventure, I bought for myself a durian flavored ice cream. Were you able to finish it? Um, I don't normally throw food away. Coming from our country, uh, it's a principle for me that everything that comes on the plate should be eaten by us. There are millions around the world without adequate food. And it's a respect for food that makes me eat whatever. So I did eat that whole thing. It's a great principle. And it's an experience I will never forget. So this durian's flavor uh, orders. <laughs> Are, can be explained as a, a, a sewage, a, pork excre uh, a pig excretory, um, a kind of gas. Uh, it's very peculiar. I tried this in Thailand on day one. It was weird for me. I tried on day two. It was okay for me. And by the end of my visit, uh, I was loving this fruit. It's only for the first few times that you have this disgust towards the fruit. 
but once you get and addicted, i thought you were a good guy <laughs> i am still <laughs> so that's my story with durian i went to the durian farms i went to the durian markets i understood the different varieties of durians uh, uh, when i went to malaysia also i was hunting for the best durians available in the market in the season uh, indonesia also have got their varieties of durians it might be a cook it also or how do they okay for those who are not familiar with durian this is a fruit largish almost like jackfruit in some cases like panasakaya uh, but usually found much smaller and sold everywhere in in the southeast asian region and it has a peculiar smell you can smell it if you are on the same street as where the shop is and people either love it it seems that aditya is in that political party and <laughs> those who don't like it like me um so my question is about that fruit durian so do they cook it aditya i have not come across uh, cooking of this fruit but as you said you can definitely say there's a durian shop from the start of the street when the shop is at the end of the street <laughs> <laughs> and being in australia have you ever tasted vegemite might <laughs> oh yes that is next to durian in my list <laughs> so this is an yeast extract that was generally started by using the waste of the yeast from the alcohol process the alcohol make manufacturing process so in australia and also in england this was this this is uh, this product is descent of england where they have it in the name of mermaid if i'm not wrong and in vegemite in australia this is a yeast extract that they generally have on it spread as a spread on the toast of a bread every day in the morning along like with the jam test absolutely like yes like bread and jam yes i tried a few times but uh, i still did not get hang on it it's it's sort of it is not into my taste uh, <laughs> and wasabi is also a hot radish paste that they use in japan uh, as a condiment for sushi it's very strong and i had a funny incident happen in my hotel experience uh, where uh, because this is very uncommon for many of the indians and also for south indians i'm sure no one knows it unless they are a foodie or they are into food industry this is a green condiment from hot radish which is very sharp in flavor it hits on to your your uh, throat nose very strongly and well, we must uh, we must perhaps explain to the listener that when you eat japanese food especially sushi you are served with a little paste which is green in color which is made of horse radish and that is the one you are you are um, describing as very strong in how it smells and tastes i think harsh is the right word than strong <laughs> it's very harsh <laughs> uh, so what happened was uh, on the buffet we had this wasabi green wasabi that's been decorated this generally is being designed there is a design pattern or a shape that's given to wasabi to look it more appealing the consumption of wasabi in your meal will be very minute you'll be just um, a small quantity a gram less than a gram that you eat along with your meal a person had just taken a spoonful of wasabi thinking that it's some kind of halwa and then had it to your plate and no one was observing if someone was observing they definitely told him and he took the entire spoon of wasabi into into his mouth and then i'm sure you can imagine what happened later on is there a hospital near your <laughs> restaurant there is not but we, we we tried to calm him down cool, cool him down and then after he was uh, given a medical assistance generally hotels also have a medic in in in, in the house itself so that any of the food allergies or this kind of things happen actually i am aware of people hospitalized after um unusual quantities of uh, wasabi being consumed but there is one benefit of eating wasabi um, i am a lover of wasabi i eat more than what normally people do um and then it reminds you that you have a brain because it hits you so <laughs> it hits hard 
the feeling goes up right to the top of your head. It's like you smelled ammonia fresh from the gas canister. And it hits you, does it not? Good comparison, sir. You know, for people who don't know wasabi, it's like ammonia. If you have ever smelled ammonia in your chemistry lab, that's what the, the sensation of your sense when you have this wasabi. A full wasabi. lung full of ammonia, not just a whiff. <laughs> and, they feel, and they think in Japan and other parts where they have this wasabi, they think that this clears your, your throat. It, if you are having a cold, this will clear your cold as well. Because that's harsh it is. But when you take this in a limited quantities along with your sushi, it generally helps the sushi, the sushi to taste better. Oh, it's, also, it's, a brilliant thing. it's a brilliant thing for me. Um, but please go on. What other things have you on the plate for us today? Looks like you're already hungry with these things. Uh, <laughs> we spoke about many, many foods so far from plant-based, animal-based. Uh, we also spoke about seafood and meats. We also spoke about fungi. There's also the two other things that I would want to add to this list. Algae, the seaweed, which is extensively used in Japan as well. They have kombu, kelp, nori, the lot of other varieties of seaweed that they eat. Uh, these algae have umami flavor that we explained in episode number four because of the glutamate that they contain. And there are thickeners like xanthan that's been derived from this algae uh, to thicken to to thicken the food products that is in molecular gastronomy and also agar agar is also being derived from this algae if you have ever had a sushi i'm sure you would have observed a black seaweed sheet that's rolled in sushi either inside or outside mm -hmm. this is what i'm referring to mm. and in japan there are uh, the seaweed farms where they grow the seaweed and then they have it in their soups, sushis. If you have ever had a miso soup, there is there is seaweed into it, uh, into, into the fried rice, into the noodles, into the sushis, into the sashimis. They mix with the seaweed, seaweed and have as a salad. Uh, so this is also a food for Japanese people. High this in is antioxidants. all very, very mouth-watering, Aditya. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I know that uh, in Thailand, they fry the seaweed and um, I think lace it with a bit of sugar as well. Um, in London, it was one of the favorite um, dishes my son enjoyed. Mm -hmm. um, but seaweed could also be considered a replacement food, is it not? Yes, for people who think, uh, who think vegetarianism is the way to go, uh, and they miss on many of the micronutrients. They take the seaweed algae as a substitute, especially vegan people. They take uh, tablets or medicines, uh, vitamins made up of the seaweed. And we know spirulina. Spirulina is also used as suspension of spirulina for helping in digestion and nutrition and um, maybe when we talk of the future of food, mm -hmm. uh, we could look at those aspects too. Certainly, sir. Uh, of course, cerulea is more bacteria rather than algae. But yes, let's continue. And uh, work, have you ever heard of metals being eaten? You would have definitely seen... Hyderabad, Hyderabad. Yes. <laughs> Yes, if you have ever walked into a sweet shop in Hyderabad, uh, you would have seen the Indian sweets are garnished with this work. The work is a very super fine, thin sheet of metal like silver and gold. Uh, there is also a mention of uh, basmas in Ayurveda where they say the, the metals, the, the ashes of metals to be consumed, which is completely nonsense because there are health hazards to have this basmas, but we are referring to uh, uncooked, only a beaten metals. So this gold or work, uh, this gold work or silver work, they are flattened between the intestines of a cow or an ox. And there is a, uh, there is a section of people who does this job by beating the gold and silver 
and they are used as garnish in many food. But I have to say that our digestion system cannot digest any metals, especially metals like this, metals in a direct form, because we don't have that system. We don't have that mechanism in the intestines. So even though you think that you're eating gold and silver, it is just like you eating a grass because we can't digest cellulose and we can't digest gold and silver. Uh, people would have thought, people still believe that gold is gold and silver. Silver they attribute as antibacterial and gold for the health while they, when they eat this because they might have been confused with the, with the shine, the glaze from, of these metals. When this confusion happens, when you don't know the spectrum of light, why gold is gold has that orangish yellow tinge and silver has got that silverish color to it. It is pure confusion. There's also, if I'm not wrong, in England, they also eat this gold and silver as food. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that $180 um, burger gold. had a foil of gold as part of its filling. Yeah, one of the expensive dishes in the world from a restaurant in New York, if I'm not wrong. That is correct. That is correct. Um, Do you know that? Uh, work, yeah. I know that if you go to the old city of Hyderabad, in the by lanes, you will have these workshops where people have between the skin of animals or intestines of animals little pieces of metal that they beat the hell out of so that it becomes as thin as 0.2 micron or something like that it's very fragile it's very very delicate and that process with animal products is then used in shops with say pure vegetarian sweets the government of india has banned the usage of the work being beaten between the guts of an animal because the it is it is not completely a vegetarian <laughs> that is from 19, 2016 the law has uh, said that you cannot do it anymore with animal products we are very right yeah uh, so these are all the different uh, uncommon foods that I've put. Uh, but I do want to uh, say this about um, Ayurveda and Basmas. Um, anyone who is listening and is taking what is dispensed as Ayurvedic medicine need to understand that Basmas mean metallic salts. Metallic salts go and directly sit in your kidneys. They are not excreted, they are there. And continuous long-term use of metallic salts as what you think is medicine or as anything is bound to result in failed kidneys and early death. People need to keep this in mind. This is actually not food. This is not even medicine. This is toxic, life-taking, dangerous chemical that you are taking thinking it'll cure you it'll cure you of life not of disease just keep this in mind thanks for enlightening sir modern medicine is only the way for your health but not all these uh, superstitions and as you spoke about the snake heart now you're talking about toxins and superstitions uh, we that they in china also they have the snake meat as well uh, the fried, they, there is a special dish or is, rather to say a culture saying that there are there is a snake uh, meal which consists of 12 kinds of snake uh, um, cooking processes. They have fried snake, they have uh, steamed snake, they have soup of the snake. So we can choose a snake, they cut into pieces, they disk in it, cut into pieces. And then they make it into different kinds of fish dishes, approximately 12. And this reminds me of a god person from India who claims to have the poison of a snake along with milk. But people need to understand venom is a protein uh, which is used by snake as, uh, as its uh, uh, safety measure uh, and uses only are you, when it feeds. Are you talking about Jagadish Vasudev? That's right. <laughs> 
uh, then, the chap who says he is the sad guru. <laughs> Absolutely, sir. You are the language teacher. You know best. It's the sad guru. Uh, and so uh, this guy, this guy is um, an engineer by by training, and has said the most ridiculous things an educated person can say. Um, yeah, we should not hesitate from naming the ones who are poisoning our minds with absurd ideas. He is the fellow who says, don't sleep with your head to the north. <laughs> he is the fellow who says women should not go into temples because of uh, all kinds of mystic tantric claims that he makes. If one should not sleep with the head or not, then how should the astronaut sleep? Is there any northeast to west in, in the states? <laughs> I think these are the people that we discussed who has lobster heads. Don't forget that, sir. So north or south, does it matter? They have no head. <laughs> Heads full of shit. Um, so, and so, consumption so of this upsetting. venom in milk. Yeah, consumption so of this venom in milk. To see the kind of grip these ignorant fellows have on the minds of many uh, literate and educated people, otherwise intelligent, but not in these matters. I'm worried of people welfare, whoever follows his talks and his preachings and when I'm, people need to understand it is only uh, hazardous for us when it is mixed with the blood. When you drink it as a as a uh, along with the milk into your stomach, your stomach cannot digest it and it throws it out. If there is any ulcer Unless in your you stomach. You have ulcers in your in yes. your stomach, right? If you have ulcers or cuts in your tongue, then I dare you will be alive for the next day. Hmm. So people shouldn't try these adventures. Definitely but not. But the fact yes. is snake poison, which is correctly called venom, is dangerous when the snake bites you because it enters your bloodstream. But if the snake poison is the venom, is consumed as if it was food and you have no skin tears and no exposure to uh, to the inside of the body, then you are unharmed. That's good, sir. Uh, this, these are the lists that I have put together, put together to understand different cultures of uncommon food. Now let's see food, how it has been evolved with the demographical needs. Demographical means people's um, composition and their movements. Are you thinking of that? Yes, the availability, okay. the environment, climate, the, the local uh, availabilities, things like that. So Dampuktis is a process of cooking, is a process of cooking uh, that's used from Mughals and also in Rajasthani hunting culture that where there is scarcity of water, you have entire cuisine to cook with less of water because because the, the entire cuisine is based upon cooking in a pot with the lids on. So the steam, the moisture that's generated from the meat or the vegetables is retained in the pot itself and the steam cooks the meats along with the spices. And it's also a good way of having your nutrients kept because there are nutrients which are water soluble, there are nutrients which are fat soluble, which might be lost when we are cooking and steaming and boiling. Uh, is that why we also say dum biryani? Absolutely right, sir, because the method what is used in dum biryani is dum pukt. There is an entire cuisine. If you go to Lucknow, there's a dum pukt cuisine. You have different kinds of uh, dishes from vegetarian, seafood, meats, rice dishes that's, that's are cooked in dum pukt. We also spoke about Irani chai, which is also cooked in, in this particular way of cooking. And Kebab is also part of this, this dampuk generally because kebab means ab is water. Kebab means without water. So as we first discussed in our first episode, um, the kebab, the, the first humans ever cooked dish, is always with, without water. So you can just char the meat on the fire. So these are the, these are the demographical, uh, demographical, uh, what do you call the Processes that demo, or the right word to use, I'm not getting it. 
um, so uh, when there is scarcity of water, they have come up with the entire cuisine. So there's a demand of the demographic that they have to come up with such kind of dishes. And of geography as well. Yes. yes. Have you have you heard that Indian people say many of the Indians, uh, so-called Brahmins, say that it should not be eating meats and non-vegetarians? But contradictory to this statement, the Kashmiri Pandits eat meats because at that cold temperatures you have to have you have to have meat to keep you warm. And the Bengali Brahmins have fish, which is hilsa, their favorite fish from from the um, Calcutta River. So, uh, Telangana cuisine is, is a mix of Andhra, Karnataka, Maharashtra cuisine. As I spoke in earlier uh, episodes, Maratha cuisine is a warrior food. The local availabilities also uh, influence the, the cuisine development. In Kerala, the coconut is widely used because the coastal region has got a lot of coconut plantation that, that they use the coconut coir for as, as a charcoal litting fire and they use the coconut water, they use the coconut shells to make uh, artifacts and spoons and ladles to serve the food. Uh, the, they, they cook the food with coconut oil, they make a lot of dishes with uh, coconut infusion, infusion, they make deserts with coconut, they put coconut in their biryanis, in their rice. So the rice rich regions like Andhra Pradesh, we have got, we've got a lot of, which we will explain in previous episodes of how rice has been a culture for South Indians and South Asians. The, the Puntikura, also Gungura, is a red sorrel in Telangana, which they make uh, a, a curry with that, with this leaf. And the polisal fish from Godavari region is, is found in that region. That's why they they regard this fish as very high. And if, if the son-in-law comes to a house, this fish is definitely uh, a dish in his meal. Uh, mm. Tamarinds are widely available, even though it's the origin of Africa, it's widely available in, in South Indian. That's why we love to add that tamarind to our sambars and rasams. Rail so tamarind sna- comes from Africa? Yes. And yet its biolog- its scientific name is Tamarindicus indica. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's origin of Africa. Yeah, but so interesting that the scientific name refers to it as Indian. Indica is is the 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 name for India there, but so very interesting. Please go on. And uh, uh, the Rail Sima is generally the region in in Andhra Pradesh, uh, which is generally a dry region. Uh, so the crops are grown where there is where these crops only take less amount of water when compared to rice. So j- millets, jowar are the crops here which need less of water for their growth. That's why you see Ragi Sangati, Janarota in these regions. And if you see in the North Indian cuisine, the, the cuisine is very rich with butters, creams, dairy fats, nuts, dry fruits. And you come to the South, it's just poor, it's a, it's a poor in, nutritious, in nutrition because we have a lot of carbohydrates in terms of rice and lentils because of so much of uh, brainwashed by vegetarianism, there is there mm. is not much there is not much non-vegetarian. Uh, we'll speak about the malnutrition in India and how religion has uh, led to Indian malnutrition in there. And uh, we only know North Indian cuisine and South Indian cuisine, but there is also Indo-Chinese cuisine in, to the northeastern and uh, northeastern of India and to the border of China, Tibet and Bangladesh, Burma, where, where the Indian um, dishes are cooked in Chinese way, like Manchurians, uh, manchow soups, uh, star fried noodles, there are momos, which have got both the flavors and infusions of India and China. There are also innovative foods that made, uh, let's say, like biryani, uh, we said that biryani is cooked in the dumpuk met- method with a lid on. In initial days, when, when they don't have the lids, they use the dough to make a flat parda. Parda is, is like a, um, it's a curtain. A sheet. A sheet to cover the, the, the pot of biryani. And once the biryani is cooked, you can have the rice, 
as a biryani and you can also have the bread which is, which is the parda on the on 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 the biryani pot recently i have very interested with the battle of biryanis on twitter by ktr and niti ayog ceo mr amitabh kant where they were saying that um, their biryanis are best that is telangana minister ktr yes uh, who uh-huh. says that uh, this started with amitabh kant saying that uh, the talaseri biryani from kerala is the best biryani which ktr differs and says hyderabad the biryani is the best biryani there are many differences in <laughs> There are many varieties of biryanis. There, there are uh, Bengali biryanis where they add potatoes to the biryani, uh, thalassery biryani. There is mopla biryani. There is avadhi biryani. There is Punjabi version of biryani. There is uh, uh, pulao of uh, Godavari district, which they said not curry pulao. Uh, there are different varieties and there and is the kunda biryani. There is kunda biryani. Uh, But you know what? I you mentioned mopla biryani last time too. how many know that mopla is a region uh, muslim uh, predominantly which was associated with a rebellion against the british the mopla fight for independence and rebellion is quite well known uh, in that part of the world uh, but not in the rest of the country where very often the loyalty of muslims is questioned openly brazenly and shamelessly by people and the mopla revolution rebellion uh, would be an answer to that nonsense talk having said that i was persuaded to try mopla biryani and i will say any day the hyderabadi biryani is superior in refinement and taste I I definitely don't want to go in a debate with you. <laughs> I want to be safe. Uh, But you are the chef. I'm sure. I'm the consumer. As a chef, also I say that Hyderabadi biryani is the best biryani. Not because I come from Hyderabad. It's because of the method that it is made. Uh, in other biryanis, the meat is cooked separately. The meat or vegetables or seafood is cooked separately. In the rice is cooked separate. Uh, I'm sorry. Meat and rice are cooked together. Uh, Uh, they boil together or steam together or the meat and rice are already pre cooked separately and then they brought together in one pot and again steamed but the hyderabadi biryani it's made from raw the raw chicken or raw mutton or raw seafood is marinated with yogurt and spices ginger garlic paste and fried onions and your favorite coriander uh, <laughs> it is then layered with half cooked rice and then topped with saffron more more fried onions cardamom and then cooked in dum so there is there is a skill involved and the 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 meats being raw it brings best of the umami flavors into the biryani mm. i love hyderabadi biryani and i miss it <laughs> in australia i think uh, there is one thing for sure there have been very crude versions of biryani like avakaya biryani they made a film out of it also do you know that the actor who is the hero of avakaya biryani mm. he is a humanist himself who is he sir um now immediately now i can't remember his uh, his name you know is a gutta family of which gutta jwala the tennis player the badminton player uh, comes he is her cousin oh my goodness i why i can't remember his name now i don't know i met him i quite like kamal his work kamal as an architect in kamal kamaraju is it right yes absolutely it's kamal okay um and who is a fantastic painter um and kamal happens to be a junior from my school which is how i met him he came and said hello uh and then i've been following how he is um trying to be rational minded in a world full of vastu because he's an architect mm-hmm. great uh, so we have <laughs> so we have uh we have avakaya biryani and then we have ulavacharu biryani but these are crude versions of a refined food uh while you say uh correctly that it became important for the armies because this was one thing that could be cooked without the cook in attendance 
on a slow fire when the army was out on um, attacking and pillaging other places. But it has then become the food of the rulers, of, of the sovereigns of a nation. And there it went through various refinements. And that is what we know as Hyderabadi biryani, a refined way of eating food, uh, delicate, fragrance, full, uh, pleasing to the eye and to the tongue. And as you previously reminded us, it's here in the southern part of India that yogurt started getting added to this and so on and so forth. So that's not the case with Mopla biryani or other biryanis. Um, so the refinement, if you are seeking it, you don't seek that in every meal that you eat, then Hyderabadi stuff is very good. And the Mopla biryani this is uh, a short grain rice where Hyderabadi rice is um, a long grain basmati rice, which also adds more fragrance to the biryani. Absolutely. And as a chef and coming from Hyderabad, maybe you like say it's a crude. I've also tried different uh, varieties of biryanis, making pasta biryanis, idiapam biryanis, idli biryanis, uh, couscous biryanis, fregola. No, biryanis. it's not. It's not crude. It's just crazy. <laughs> So we have to be innovative to bring out fusion. Imagine food. having idli biryani. Come on, come on. <laughs> I, I think you should not be given a visa. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to say that uh, I've, I've been a rationalist and atheist and applied my visa to Australia on a Sunday when it was Amawasya. Many <laughs> people deferred to me, but I just want to prove the point. Amawasya Sunday is just like any other day. And to everyone's shocking, the day I lost on Sunday, it's, a, it's an online uh, visa application to Australia. Uh, among many people throughout the world who wait for years to get visa, I've got in one day. The next day morning I woke up, my visa was granted in my email. Amazing. So, <laughs> and I have to tell you, I have not been to any of the so-called visa granting temples. I've not done any revolutions. <laughs> around the shrines, I went to the right paths. I did my paperwork. I went to a consultancy. I read the websites of embassy. This is the process to get a visa, mm -hmm. not to go to temples and go revolutions around the shrines. That won't help you. And whether it might so be you, Sunday or uh, Monday, it depends upon your credentials, but not about the days and your astrologies. This is inspiring. You know what? You mentioned the visa temple. You know th what the Visa Temple Pujari did just day before yesterday? He led a huge prayer meeting with 2000 people to stop the world from suffering from coronavirus. I think he should be given visa to go to Wuhan now. <laughs> um, this, this gentleman uh, on television once declared that he was my admirer, that he admired what I said that he respected the information and knowledge I shared on TV. But what he was doing two days ago was what only fools do. When you are in a crisis and the crisis has to do with really an epidemic of sorts, then it's to the doctors that you have to give the support and look to for, for an answer to these problems. And then Strangely, the in his family, there are microbiologists from Osman <laughs> University. And in this great outbreak of viruses period, all the religious centers get shut. But the only thing that keeps the doors open are hospitals, because hospitals are based on science. All the other temples, when there is eclipse also shuts its, its doors, but the place of science, medicine, and the hospitals keep open when the humans are in need. That is how science helps in life. Not what a fantastic thing you said, Aditya. Thank you for saying that. In an epidemic, in a crisis, temples are shut down, but hospitals are open. That tells us where the future of humanity is. And what works as well, not religion, the science works. Super. What a wonderful thing. 
Let's As we forward. come towards the end of this uh, show, uh, biryani finally is made, uh, is at least with origins in Persia. But are there food preparations, rice based um, from India itself? Yes, sir. Uh, Kulhora is, an in, is a South Indian version of rice, uh, which is tempered and there is acid. Kulhora. Yeah, the tamarind rice or lemon rice, which, which are... tamarind that comes from Africa. Yes. So this, <laughs> yeah. this, was, this was... And rice that comes from China. Yes, and the dish is from South India. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, tell, tell us about Pulihora. This was uh, emerged as a need of travelers. So when there was no refrigerations, when there was no proper food safeties, uh, when people are traveling, they need food that stays a little bit longer. As is mentioned, that the the discovery of if, uh, using egg of egg as a water bottle had left people to go for long distance. Now they, they also need a food that can feed them in long distance. So they came up with this rice and uh, citric acid food pulihora because of the high content of salt and citric acid in it of tamarind or uh, lemon lemon juice. Sometimes they use the uh, created raw mango as well. Sometimes they use uh, gongura as well, the red, red sorrel as well to make these pulihoras. So, these things keep the rice dish for a little longer time because the pH value of this food is higher and less likely to get spoiled in a short period of time and it keeps away from the bacteria. But it's not for a very long time, for a very short time. It also makes me think of Vada Pao, which is also emerged by the demand uh, at the uh, mill in Mumbai, a mill region in Mumbai where the mill workers had to have a cheap food uh, that is wholesome as well and it is high in carbohydrates. So the bread from Europe is taken, uh, the potatoes from somewhere else is taken and it is made into a patty uh, and it is stuffed inside a bread with chilies and mint chutney. Uh, it is a version of Indian burger you can say. Uh, so this also been emerged because of the demand of people. Uh, it mentioned that cheese in other countries, there are also cheese in India, like paneer and chana. Do you know that there is a fight between state governments of Odisha and uh, Bengal, claiming that this is rasagulla is of their own state's origin. Odisha says that it, it's it's a um, Puri Jagannath's uh, prasad. That's where it started and Calcutta begs to differ and say it's the origin of uh, Bengal. And they both had applied for their geographical index for this food, Rasagulla. Uh, and both have got, I think, both have got their own indexes for this, saying that one is Bengali version of Rasagulla and one is Odisha version of Rasagulla. That's Isn't how... Isn't that uh, strange? Because Rasagulla is believed to have originated in a sweet shop, not in a temple. <laughs> That's true, sir, as well. <laughs> so the governments are fighting as well to, to claiming the food is from their origin. It's interesting. Uh, so when governments are involved, let's also talk about the law that government makes. Uh, in mythologies, if you hunt a deer, you may, be, you may be treated as a god. But in real, real life, a hero goes to court for hunting a deer. And the hot oh heat. yes, you mean you mean it's a crime to go hunt deer. Absolutely yes. And, and Salman Khan was a guy. Pataudi was another who have been charged with hunting deer illegally with all their privilege as rich people breaking yes. the law. Yes, the law is stronger than anyone else. It might be rich or a celebrity. Uh, hot meat in USA. It, you have a law on it saying that uh, you cannot slaughter the horse in USA, but you can eat the meat in there. So the horse meat is imported to USA from other countries. And in different states of India, some of the states have banned beef because of their religious beliefs, forgetting that India is a malnutrition, India is a peop India is a country where there's a lot of malnutrition in people and beef is also a great source of iron. 
Mm. So you you are saying um, beef is important for human nutrition. Yes, sir, for sure. The, by vegeta by vegetarianism, you would not get all the nutrients that you would need for your body. You should also seek some seafood. You should also seek some nuts, some seeds, some plants, some vegetation, some meats, because the amount of iron that you get in 100 grams of beef, you may have to eat a spinach of higher quantity. <laughs> Which is how humans became intelligent, is it not? When That's they right. did not have to eat so much of grass or plant-based food for their nutritional requirements, if they switched to meat, then they required amount of food was less which meant they had easier protein access, which meant that the energy resources of the human body could then be directed towards the growth of the brain, which is how the brain grew, and it grew so much that now they want us not to eat meat. These are the people whose brains are still not developed, sir. <laughs> so we spoke so much about food and culture. Now I want to talk few sensitive topics like food safety, which which is not much of uh, importance in India. Uh, the way food is cooked, prepared, served or made in India is not at the level of acceptance because... Uh, is, that, uh, is that something we shall address in the next episode then? Definitely, sir. Well, I let us close this particular discussion at this point. Um, thank you for being for well more than an hour with me, Aditya, and taking me on this really interesting, fascinating, slightly disgusting journey. Uh, disgusting for me personally, I mean, uh, eating the embryo of something or durian fruit and so on. But this fascinating landscape, humanscape, with all its different tastes and inclinations and taboos and approaches to food. Um, in the last five episodes, we looked at the history of food, its refinement into defining the way we live, defining life itself, how it became it was a result of other technologies humans learned. When humans had the technology of Stone Age tools, um, they ate one kind of food. When they had the technology of the plow, they knew how to cultivate. When they knew how to cultivate, the food moved towards, definitely towards grains and ultimately rice and wheat. When they were able to domesticate animals, then their food incorporated a steady diet of meat. That could be duck and chickens and um, lamb and beef and sometimes deer. And as we started knowing how to preserve food, how to enhance its taste, with the use of various condiments, we knew how to preserve it with the use of some spices sometimes or sometimes with controlling the temperature in which the food is stored. Our connection with food changed and we also know how it is influenced by our belief systems and our approach. In the early discussions, Aditya, you mentioned that certain kinds of food were considered taboo because you had to dig them out from the earth. They were roots, they were hidden from view of the humans. And there were some which were considered impure foods. Some were considered pure foods. There was tamasic and sattvic foods. There was a belief that if you ate certain kinds of food, then your character would be defined by it. So you ate gentle food, so to say, and you became gentle people. And for that, we consider the example of Hitler, 
who caused the deaths of six crores of people around the world. And he was a vegetarian. And the fact that it was vegetarian communities which insisted on the practice of untouchability in the Indian subcontinent. Food doesn't decide your character, but it does decide your health. And the way you gather that food or bring it to the table reflects the values you hold. It doesn't decide your values, but it reflects your values. If you were to subject an animal to avoidable pain before consuming it, then it reflects your values on how you think um, you relate to other forms of life, your approach to the environment. But the logic of life is life consumes life to remain alive. So we were really happy to have surveyed this great variety of food and our approaches to it, its history. And then now you're talking about food technologies, food safety. Um, these are things I'm sure we have to address in the next episode um, because we've literally run out of time. So let's do that in the next episode, um, Aditya. Thank sure, you so sir. much for being with me. Thanks, sir. Thanks for your contribution and your ideas as well. And I have to thank uh, Sri Nishant Garu and uh, Sri Josna Palvai Garu to make this happen. Thanks a lot. Thank you.